Department of the Army. The Secretary's report is based on the findings of an inspection conducted by the Department of Army in Inspector General. Overall, there is clear evidence that substantial improvements have taken place at Arlington. That pro progress reflects not only in the personal commitment of Secretary John McHugh, but also the professionalism and commitment of Ms. Catherine Condon, the Executive Director of the Army National Cemeteries Program, and Patrick Hallinan, the Superintendent of Arlington Cemetery. While great strides have been made, much still remains to be done. My focus in the hearing will be where we go from here. I am especially concerned about the Inspector General's findings that the wait time for burials is substantially longer than previously reported. We need to find an appropriate way soon to reduce that waiting time. Before I introduce our witnesses, let me recognize in turn Ranking Member Susan Davis of the Military Personnel Subcommittee, uh, Rob Whitman, who is Chairman of the Oversight and Investigations Committee, Subcommittee, and Jim Cooper, who is the Ranking Member of the Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee, for any opening remarks they may wish. Today we will hear – and so I now recognize Ms. Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Condon and Mr. Hallin uh, Hallinan, it's good to see you. I know you've been here before. Thank you. Welcome. General McCoy, thank you for being here, and we look forward to hearing your assessment of Arlington and how it compares to last year's review. Today our hearing is being held jointly with the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, so I certainly want to welcome our colleagues uh, from the Oversight Subcommittee as well. The Arlington National Cemetery is the final resting place for those who made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their nation. It is a place where we expect and we should demand the highest standard of conduct and performance of its employees, from management to the lowest levels of the workforce. Sadly, the actions of a few individuals have tarnished the renowned reputation of this hallowed ground, and so we're here to ensure that such actions never occur again, and to begin to restore the trust <clears throat> that has been eroded by recent rev revelations. General McCoy, your report seems to suggest that the Army has made significant improvements at Arlington, and I have been impressed by the ongoing uh, reports that we've had, but more can be done. Ms. Condon and Mr. Hallinan, it seems you have turned things around, and that, again, has, has been impressive in a relatively short period of time. But the question that I have is, can this focus be maintained, and what impact, if any, will potential budget concerns have on the impact of the operations of the cemetery? I look forward to hearing from you on what has been accomplished for to date and what the long-term strategic vision is for the cemetery, and ultimately how those plans may or may not be affected by the current budget environment. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, Chairman Rob Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Ms. Condon, Mr. Hallinan, General McCoy. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today, and I'm especially pleased that you brought along Captain Nate Peterson, who played such an critical role in the Accountability Task Force. Captain Peterson, thank you so much for your efforts. I want to thank uh, not only Captain Peterson, but other members of your team, such as Sergeant John McDermott, for your efforts. Because of you, we now have an accurate count of grave sites and markers at Arlington, which will ensure that future plans are based on real facts and data, not supposition. You should be proud of the service you provided to the task force, and more importantly, to your nation. You've accomplished your duty with remarkable precision and diligence, and have represented the old guard well. Great job. Arlington Cemetery is a special place for many reasons, but for me, it's special because it's where generations of heroes have been laid to rest. It's a place where we can go and pay appropriate tribute to heroes who dedicated their lives to others and answered our nation's call to duty despite the sacrifices associated with doing so. It's why I feel so passionately about accountability and oversight of Arlington, 
and why I was happy to read about the recent progress that's been made on a number of issues. In particular, I was happy to learn that the IG didn't identify any deficiencies during the most recent inspection. And I'm happy to know that the Army has dedicated the manpower and resources to hopefully sustain this progress moving forward. That said, I note a number of issues that continue to cause concern, such as employee training, acquisition and contracting procedures, and oversight, and also long-term organizational plans and oversight regimes. I hope today that you'll address these issues, and I look forward to hearing your views on how they will be addressed moving forward. Again, thank all of you for being here today, and thank you for your service to our nation. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. We now proceed to Ranking Member Jim Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to welcome the witnesses. I have no opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Today we will be hearing from Major General William McCoy, Deputy, Deputy Inspector General, U.S. Army, to be followed by Ms. Catherine Condon, Executive Director of the Army's National Cemeteries Program. Ms. Condon is accompanied by Mr. Patrick Hallinan, who is the Superintendent of Arlington National Cemetery. Before I recognize our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent that a statement from the American Legion be entered into the record. Members will find the statement and the material before them. Hearing no objection, it shall be admitted. At this time, we'll begin right away with General McCoy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members, thank you for the invitation and opportunity to speak to you today about Arlington National Cemetery. I became the Deputy Inspector General in October of 2008 and have also been serving as the Acting Inspector General since 13 August, when, uh, 13 August 2010 when Lieutenant General Whitcomb retired. During my time as Deputy and now the Acting Inspector General, I have been intimately involved in all efforts concerning Arlington National Cemetery almost continuously since July of 2009. Since then, the Inspector General Agency has conducted two full inspections and an interim review this past January, and we've conducted six investigations involving 21 matters of alleged misconduct. On 10 June 2010, after reviewing both the IG inspection and the investigation report, Secretary McHugh issued Army Directive 2010-04, entitled Enhancing the Operation and Oversight of Army National Cemeteries. The directive established the Army National Cemeteries Program director, uh, Executive Director position and tasked her to establish an accountability baseline for all grave sites and inurnment niches at the cemetery. It further tasked agencies and organizations across the Army to accomplish numerous actions in support of the improvement of cemetery processes and procedures. The recent 2011 IG inspection had three objectives. First, to assess action on deficiencies identified in the 2010 report. Second, to assess implementation of Army Directive 2010-04. And third, to assess the cemetery's efforts to provide outreach information and support to family members who inquire about possible burial discrepancies at Arlington National Cemetery. I'll describe the inspection team's findings during the remainder of this statement. Up front, I believe our report and what you will hear today will show that the changes that have taken place in the last year are a good news story. As much as the Army regretted having to report the many deficiencies found at Arlington a year ago, I am proud to report that the deficiencies have been substantially corrected this year. I attribute these improvements to three things. First, the direct supervision and direction of the Secretary of the Army, Mr. McHugh. Second, the strong, focused leadership of Ms. Condon and Mr. Hallinan. And finally, the application of the full force of Army resources to correcting deficiencies at Arlington National Cemetery. Bottom line, in my opinion, the mismanagement and deficiencies found and reported to you last year no longer exist. Some of the key findings I'll discuss next. Since the Secretary signed Army Directive 2010-04, the Executive Director has led her staff and other Army stakeholders to make significant improvements at Arlington while still accomplishing the cemetery's daily mission. Our 2010 IG inspection identified 76 findings and made 101 recommendations. 61 of those findings were deficiencies. This year, there were no deficiencies noted, 
We made 31 observations and noted two other matters for consideration on the progress that has been made and the work that is still to be done. This alone underscores the tremendous progress ANC and the Army have made in correcting the problems at Arlington. Let me talk first to the culture. The insularity, which contributed so significantly to the mismanagement and deficiencies last year, no longer exists at Arlington National Cemetery. Instead, the executive director has established an environment of collaboration, cooperation, and coordination with supporting Army staff, commands, and agencies. Equally important is the transformation of the cemetery's organizational climate. We administered two Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute surveys to cemetery employees this past year, one in January of 2011 and the second in June of 2011. Both surveys reflect steadily improving morale and organizational effectiveness over the last year. Sensing sessions conducted by inspectors confirm those survey findings. These radical improvements in the organizational climate and workforce attitude can be attributed directly to the strong leadership style and approach of both the executive director and the superintendent. With regard to automated systems and processes, ANC now possesses a fully functional information technology architecture enabled by current software applications and hardware and supported by a comprehensive service agreement with the Army's Information Technology Agency. For instance, this morning while we sit here uh, with Ms. Condon and Mr. Hallinan, they're conducting 12 funerals at Arlington National Cemetery. We could not have told you that reliably last year. This year you can get it off their website. It's pretty incredible. ANC has partnered with ITA to route all incoming calls to ITA's Consolidated Customer Service Center at Fort Detrick, Maryland. This has significantly improved customer service and enabled a tiered response system using their remedy tracking system. This system allows collaborative resolution by call center personnel and cemetery representatives and enables cemetery leaders to assess performance against established measures of effectiveness. ANC and the Veterans Administration are now partnering to integrate the cemetery's internment scheduling system and the VA's burial operations support system. This enhancement will save significant staff hours within the internment services branch. ANC has partnered also with the Army's Chief Information Officer to create a digital research tool for digitized burial records, cemetery maps, and headstone photographs which is enabling the Executive Director's Gravesite Accountability Task Force to reestablish accountability baseline for each gravesite and internment niche at Arlington. With regard to information assurance, ANC now meets Army standards in all functional areas. During the 2010 IG inspection, ANC did not meet the Army standard in any of the functional areas inspected. 57 deficiencies were identified in their information assurance program. Today I can report to you that Arlington National Cemetery's information assurance program is among the best in the Army. With regard to contracting, during the 2010 IG inspection we found the cemetery's procurement and contracting actions were not compliant with Army, Defense, or Federal acquisition regulations. Untrained and unqualified personnel were developing requirements and committing funds to contracts without appropriate, over, appropriate oversight. We also identified poor or improper contract management by the agencies charged with executing ANC's contracts. This summer, we reviewed 17 ANC service contracts from the Mission Installation Contracting Command and eight ANC engineering and construction contracts from the Army Corps of Engineers. Today, the cemetery's contracting actions are now properly aligned based on scope of work and both contracting agencies are providing support teams to ANC and are properly providing the oversight necessary to ensure that quality contracts are properly awarded. ANC is also effectively monitoring contract execution with trained and qualified contracting officer representatives. While there were some discrepancies found in contract documentation this past year, they were all minor compared to what we found last year and systems, processes, and management of contracts at Arlington, which were non-existent last year, are now consistent with best practices in the Army. With regard to Arlington's budget, 
ANC now uses Army standard financial management processes and works closely with the Army's administrative assistant and assistant secretary of the Army for financial management to ensure the development, execution, and oversight of its program and budget. Further, the executive director's decision to transition Arlington early to the general fund enterprise business system provides the Army full visibility of the cemetery's expenditures and has been critical to re reversing past budget shortfalls. Turning to Arlington's outreach to families, during this summer's inspection, we found that ANC's leadership and staff were professional and compassionate in providing information, support, and outreach to families of interned or unearned veterans when responding to possible burial discrepancies at Arlington. Immediately after assuming her position, Ms. Condon established a hotline at Arlington to respond to burial inquiries. She also developed a tiered system to ensure the proper efforts were made to address family member concerns. To date, ANC has received almost 1,300 inquiries from family members. In all but 13 cases, cemetery representatives were able to assure family members that there were no discrepancies regarding the burial of their loved one. In the 13 cases of substantiated burial discrepancies, which included the eight urns that were discovered in October of 2010, cemetery representatives worked closely with each family concerned and invited their participation in correcting the error accordingly. In the case of the eight urns found in a single grave, only four were able to be positively identified. ANC reinterred the unidentified urns as unknown remains with the full dignity and respect they provide. And to ensure that these inexcusable breaches of procedure are prevented in the future, the executive director and superintendent have thoroughly revised and imposed strict safeguards into the cemetery's procedures for interring or unearning veterans or disinterring veterans. Our key recommendations. While the Army and, and ANC staff have made great strides in correcting deficiencies noted in the 2010 IG report, there is still more to do. In this year's IG report, we presented Secretary McHugh with 53 recommendations designed to enhance the progress already made to this point. A description of some of our key recommendations follow. In the last year, the Executive Director has revised 32 code Code of Federal Regulations 533 and is now being staffed for public comment. We recognized that the CFR would need to be published before the Army regulation could be appropriately re uh, revised. The Executive Director is now working on that. We have recommended that the Executive de Director incorporate requirements for long-term, robust, and continuous oversight processes and mechanisms in the revision of the regulation. We also recommended that the Executive Director revise Department of the Army Pamphlet 290-5, Administration, Operation, and Maintenance of Army Cemeteries, to provide all 28 Army post cemeteries with sound, authoritative, and current guidance on standardized processes and procedures for cemetery operations. We also recommended a multi-service policy for Arlington in order to standardize policies, processes, and procedures for internment and inurnment honors and for the management of ceremonial and band units. We believe this will be both more efficient and more responsive. Uh, both the Secretary and the Chief of Staff of the Army are committed to ensuring we sustain the progress that we have made at Arlington. We note that the Executive Director and her staff have fundamentally transformed the control mechanisms and oversight of cemetery processes. However, to ensure this continues into the long term, we recommended that the Department of the Army G3 provide Secretary McHugh with future options on how best to integrate the Army National Cemeteries Program, command and control, organizational alignment, and support systems into an established Army organizational structure. The G3 is already conducting the analysis on that. During our inspection, we found that internments and inurnments at Arlington are increasing each year and that wait times at Arlington continues to increase. This may result in the cemetery reaching its capacity before current projections. We recommended that the Secretary of the Army request the Army National Cemetery's Advisory Commission, when convened, to examine the causes and effects of increasing wait times and increasing demand and make recommendations to contend with these issues. In conclusion, 
I believe the progress made at Arlington since last June shows a significant turnaround in performance at Arlington and demonstrates the Army's stalwart commitment to ensuring all actions at this National Shrine are exec executed to exacting standards. Ms. Condon and Mr. Halliman, Hallinan have been systematically correcting the deficiencies we found last year. Army agencies and organizations have completed or are in the process of completing the tasks specifically assigned to them by the Secretary of the Army. And Arlington's efforts to provide outreach information and support to family members are professional and compassionate. Simply put, the mismanagement that we found last year no longer exists. Much has been done, but there is still more to do. The team that is there is fully capable and focused on making continuous improvements at our Army's sacred ground. As the Army's Inspector General, I know that restoring Arlington remains a priority for the Secretary and for the Army and for me. We will conduct annual inspections there for the next two years in accordance with Public Law 111-339, but we are also looking for other external oversight um, measures and internal oversight measures that can be implemented. Further, as the son of a mother and father who are buried at Arlington, I have a personal interest in ensuring that the cemetery is properly managed. I am confident that Arlington is being run as well as possible, and I have observed constant, continuous improvement over the past 15 months. Thank you once again for the invitation and the opportunity to testify today on this most important subject. I present my written testimony to you for record and look forward to answering your questions. General, thank you so much, and we appreciate your personal commitment. Uh, as we proceed, uh, I also want to uh, recognize Representative John Runyon, a member of the Armed Services Committee, and also we appreciate his service as Chairman of the Subcommittee on Disability Assistance and Memorial Affairs of the House Veterans Affairs Committee. His subcommittee also has oversight of Arlington National Cemetery. And now we proceed with Ms. Condon. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committees, thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the progress that we have made at Arlington National Cemetery. Fifteen months ago, Secretary McHugh um, up created the position of executive director, the position that I hold, as a direct report to him to be solely responsible for all aspects of Arlington's operations, identify deficiencies, inefficiencies, and in areas of noncompliance as a result of the June 2010 Inspector General report. I am pleased to report to the subcommittees today that tremendous progress has been made and care taken to analyze the 76 deficiencies identified in that report. Since that time, the cemetery has established standards and crafted corrective actions which addressed those deficiencies. It is noted as early as March of this year, when the Inspector General did an interim review, it was stated significantly that we have significantly increased the effectiveness and efficiency in all our missions and functions. But first and foremost, the most important action taken was hiring Pat Hallinan as the superintendent. His years of cemetery experience have allowed both of us to use his words to reorganize, retrain, and retool or Arlington. Over the past year, we have increased the end strength of the organization by nearly 50 percent. We have resolved the 211 discrepancies that were identified in the 2010 IG report. We have conducted 16 physical gravesite verifications as a result of family queries. We have formed the Gravesite Accountability Task Force, which is currently in the process of establishing the accountability baseline of all gravesites and niches in the cemetery. We are in the process of updating the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. We have implemented the Army's General Fund Enterprise Business System, allowing Arlington for the first time to conduct a web-enabled financial asset and account management. We have validated all of Arlington's contracts, and as a matter of fact, we recompeted all of our service contracts this year. We brought Arlington into compliance with information assurance, and we have directed the development of a revised master plan. And more importantly, we have improved our communication with the public in the ability of families and funeral homes to schedule interments and inurements by creating an integrated call center. 
Mr. Chairman, most importantly, I want to highlight the tremendous leap in the effective use of technology at Arlington. From the soldiers of the old guard taking photos and documenting each marker in the cemetery, thank you, Captain Peterson, to replacing the paper records of the past that most of you have seen firsthand, and to replacing those with a digital system that uses industry best practices for database management. We are no longer using an IBM Selectric typewriter. To schedule interments, our team is leveraging a state-of-the-art system that ensures visibility for all appropriate stakeholders and the ability to share information like never before. And we have initiated a geospatial application development initiative in Arlington. This will form a Google Maps-like information system that enables the cemetery to better manage the grounds, for Mr. Helen Ann to assign grave and niche assignments, and to provide street directions and site locations for our guests. Although much has been accomplished, there is still a lot of work that we need to do. We are on the right path and to work to, work to earn the, and maintain the faith of the American public. To date, this calendar year, we have conducted 4,869 burials, 3,146 ceremonies, hosted over 4 million visitors and guests, and as the Inspector General stated, reviewed and addressed over 1,300 family member concerns. We have executed these efforts while also maintaining our current operational tempo. But in order to meet the ever-increasing demand for dignified services, we have expanded operations to include placement-only services on Saturday that do not require honors. And we continue to, cock, to conduct, on an average, of 27 funeral services each day. If you were to ask today what is necessary to continue this positive and fast-paced trend, it is the continued stalwart support of all of the committees that are represented in the room today. Thank you for allowing me to just highlight a few of the examples of our progress to date, and Mr. Hallinan and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you very much, and it, it really is encouraging to get this update. Uh, we, we will now be proceeding, uh, each um, panel, uh, either, every person here as a member of the subcommittees that are affected uh, will have uh, five minutes each. Uh, we have a person above reproach, John Chapler, the professional staff. Uh, who will keep the time, and, he, and he's uh, very proficient. Uh, as we proceed, um, the first question, uh, and uh, actually um, it, things are coming together here, uh, and that the question I had, uh, you've largely answered, uh, Ms. Condon, but first of all, I want to thank uh, Captain Nate Peterson, the old guard. Um, I, uh, I, it was really heartwarming to find out that they were out there uh, taking uh, headstone photographs. Gosh, that's uh, so real. And, uh, and then putting it on the website so that uh, family members, historians, um, uh, young people doing um, uh, biographies of our uh, heroes, uh, they, they can look it up. And I, two weeks ago today, uh, was at um, Arlington, uh, incredibly enough, uh, Colonel Charles P. Murray, Jr., uh, who a Medal of Honor winner who was the former deputy commander of the Old Guard uh, from Columbia, South Carolina. And it, it just warmed your heart to see the tribute uh, to our um, military heroes. Um, I'm glad you um, brought up, Ms. Condon, the um, paper, where this began largely uh, were uh, paper records that uh, were uh, incredibly disorganized. And then sadly there was an effort of digitalization uh, that did not work. Um, and so can you restate again uh, how this has been improved? Um, uh, is there any cost recovery to uh, prior era? Uh, and then um, with the computerization and the website capabilities, um, l let us know how this works. Um, certainly, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, we, as you know, we have established the Independent Accountability Task Force. And what we were able to do is we were able to, from the previous efforts to, of scanned records, to use those. But in our discovery, um, as we built our IT tools, we discovered that not all those records were scanned. So we are completely rescanning, and we have rescanned all of the paper records of the cemetery. Um, the, as a result of the old guard, 
We now can tell you that we have 259,978 gravesite locations in the cemetery. But those are just the actual locations. That does not tell you the number of decedents that we have buried in the cemetery. So what we are doing in the task force right now is to match those headstones and markers with each and every record that we have in the cemetery. And we're well on our way, sir, on that effort. And I'm glad uh, it was brought up, and I like the term, uh, general customer service. Uh, that, that means uh, customer friendly. Uh, and I was happy to hear there's been a change in the telephone system to include voicemail. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm still concerned uh, that there is a waiting list uh, for uh, in, uh, tournaments because we know that there are family members uh, who uh, are in, uh, in jeopardy uh, between the time of um, death and interment. Uh, what, what's being done, and, and you've identified some, but how, how can we help on uh, helping reduce the waiting list? Um, so you, as you know, we're almost the victims of our own success. Before, um, they only averaged answering 47 phone calls a day. Um, right now, um, we are averaging 230 phone calls. We're answering every phone call that comes into the cemetery. And of those phone calls that are coming in, the average right now is around 40 of those phone calls or for individuals scheduling an in interment service in the cemetery. Um, Mr. Hallinan and I are doing our best, and I'll turn it over to him to give the operational perspective on how we're addressing that increase in volume. One of the things that we did was, as I noted in my opening statement, was we now have Saturday services. And that's for family members and military members that do not want the honors so that we can do placements on Saturday rather than that. Um, Pat, is there anything that I missed? Uh, I, I would just add that uh, the true intent of uh, the Saturday burials was uh, a customer service initiative uh, there's no other national cemetery in the United States at this time that enters on a Saturday. We're, we're working six days a week. Uh, that's a credit to the crew. That's a credit to, uh, to the planning and, and the efforts we're leading. Uh, as, as Ms. Condon stated, we are uh, victims of our own success. We do not know how many people in the past called up, didn't get through, got frustrated, and decided to bury elsewhere. Um, the request for burials at all the team is up. I think that's, that's a good reflection on, on the trust and confidence of the American people. Uh, there, there are a lot of logistics and complexities involved, as you know, in touring at Arlington. Uh, but we are working together as a team, uh, Ms. Condon and I and our staff, along with uh, the Military District of Washington, to see what we can do on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, to try to decrease that backlog. Thank you very much. And we now proceed immediately to Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate, really, it's, it's, it's good to hear from all of you. I appreciate the fact that you said that continuous progress is really dependent on our support, and I think we all, we all heard that clearly. But I wonder if you could speak to budgetary constraints as you move forward and what you have the most concern about uh, as you know, we, we look more at the, unfortunately, the dollars and cents uh, of those improvements. Where have you found real efficiencies? And where, on the other hand, as you speak about Saturday um, burials, which is such a positive thing for our families of loved ones who are requesting Saturday burials, there's obviously a cost to that. So I think just giving us a better sense of where are we and, and what is it going to take, I guess, to keep that continuous improvement? How do you see the impacts of, of budgetary concerns? Um, Congresswoman, the issue that we have is right now we have been doing all we can, as was identified in the Inspector General report, to bring in all of the unliquidated obligations from, from previous years so that, and we have been able to use those dollars to pay for the increase in manpower, most importantly, to improve the equipment that Mr. Hellenan has introduced to the cemetery for our workforce to make us more efficient and effective. They were using outdated equipment. One of my best examples, and I don't have the experience that Mr. Hellenan has when it comes to burials, but I will scare you now what I know about running a cemetery was we used to, when you refill a, a gravesite after you do an interment, they used to use a backhoe to tamp down the, the gravesite. 
And now by just introducing equipment like a gas held tamper, um, it, we no longer had the sinkages that Mr. Hallinan and I experienced when we took over last June. But that's an efficiency because what that also means is that we're now not paying the contractor to come in and refinish, redo the grave site, resod, et cetera. So by introducing state-of-the-art modern equipment to the workforce and training the workforce, it's been an efficiency. Um, my concern is we've been capturing year, prior year money and you know that has enabled us to do all the things that we've been able to accomplish in the last year. Um, I am looking seriously you know, at the next budget submits if we do have enough to maintain and sustain the operation. And is there an area in particular that, that you would target, for example, or again, just to give us a little further direction? Um, one of the areas that, that we're most concerned about is there has been a tremendous lack of paying attention to maintenance and repair of the cemetery. Um, this summer, we had two catastrophic failures of our air conditioning units in our visitor center, which is where our four million guests go to use the restroom facilities, and also in our administration building. The administration building is where our family members come to, you know, at the start of their service. And literally, we had a catastrophic failure when we were at a 100 degree temperature. Mm -hmm. Our roads are in very poor condition, and our sidewalks. We were very fortunate that we didn't have tremendous damage with the hurricanes and earthquake, but we did have damage. So backlog of maintenance and repair, ma'am, is one area where we truly have to focus our resources in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could you comment on transferring jurisdiction to the VA? There's been discussion uh, about that, as you know, and um, I just wonder what your thoughts are about it. Congresswoman Davis, um, I was put in Arlington to fix to fix the cemetery. Um, the decision on, you know, should it go to VA, I think is well above me, but I think people who are probably better to answer that question, I'm a little parochial, um, is probably either Mr. Hallinan, from, who came from Veterans Affairs, or, you know, the Inspector General. Please. I'd be, I'd be happy to you know, offer my opinion, uh, and it's just that, it's one person's opinion, but I, I have over three decades of experience running 131 national cemeteries. Uh, that expertise is now at Arlington and it has, has contributed, I think, to some of the positive outcomes that we're testifying to today. Uh, the final decision will be left up, left up to distinguished members. That's above my purview. Uh, on a personal note, I do believe that the Army has demonstrated the resources and the commitment the question is, is, is this really a core um, uh, mission of the United States Army? And as I've told Ms. Condon, that it's been a core mission of the United States Army for 150 years since they interred those first uh, Union soldiers after the first Battle of Manassas. And the United States Army has forensic experts. It, it, it has the labs in Hawaii. It has the labs in Dover. The United States Army has the graves registration expertise. Uh, it's unfortunate what happened. Uh, we've, we've done everything we can and will continue to do to correct the mistakes of the past and ensure they do not happen again. But I believe the resources, and more importantly, the passion and commitment to the mission is there with the Army. Thank you. General McCoy, Mr. Chairman, did you want to just briefly? I would, I would like to answer that. First, as a soldier, I would tell you that uh, from the standpoint of core competencies, uh, Mr. Hallinan indicated that you know, we've been doing this for 150 years. We took our eye off the ball, I think, for, for a while. And uh, we made a mess there that we have now cleaned up. Uh, the Army is capable of running this. The Army has the resources. And if you introduced another federal agency, it would create an additional level of bureaucracy, I believe. They already coordinate and partner very closely with the Veterans Administration. Mm -hmm. As a soldier, you know, you ask us to do things that aren't really our core competency a, a lot. I mean, we do firefighting. We do nation building and nation assistance. We do things all the time. And I think the Army is probably the only organization in our government that's postured to go anywhere, anytime, and do anything and get the job done. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. And thank you for that very important question. We now proceed to Chairman Rob Whitman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General McCoy, I want to follow up on the issue of the Veterans Administration. And you noted in your report that the Army uh, has had a number of elements that they brought to bear to look at Arlington to make sure that there was progress toward institutional reform, including some direct oversight by the Secretary of the Army, and I think that's, that's admirable. 
Based on that, putting it in a larger perspective, what do you believe is the best organizational structure for Arlington? And how robust a role could the Veterans Administration play in the future? And along those lines, can you explain why the Army hasn't asked the VA to come in and do an independent evaluation to just have a, 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 an agency outside or an external group to look in and give an independent evaluation and say, hey, this is how we see things going. Here are some of our recommendations. It's great to have the internal investigation, but it's also good, I think, with another agency that has expertise in that to say, listen, why, why don't you do that? It's been recommended that that's been th that be done, and it hasn't been done. So I just want to get, get your comments on the structure and then where you see Veterans Administration playing a role in helping the future of Arlington. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you, Congressman. I uh, I would tell you that we did recommend last year uh, first a different structural solution. The Secretary uh, made a determination based on his own judgment and advice that uh, he would establish this, this structure with the ANCP, the Provisional Oversight Group, and the Executive Director, and that, that system is working. We've asked the G3 to come back and, and look for a long-term solution. In the short term, this is a good fix, and my sense is, based on what we've seen, that it has worked very well. Uh, we did recommend last year that they uh, sign an MOU with a memorandum of understanding with the Veterans Administration to partner with them on their Veterans um, Assessment and Inspection Program. Uh, Ms. Hallen and I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, Ms. Condon did one better, and she hired the expert out of Veterans Administration who wrote that program to be the superintendent. So now he's here doing that. In addition to that, she's had a lot of help, help from uh, organizations, GAO, we've been there continuously since she arrived, uh, AAA has been there, ASAL, our Assistant Secretary of the Army for Logistics and Technology has been there, this, the Chief Information Officer, uh, and, and she has in that time also established her own internal assessment programs, although she still has some work to do there. She's, she's established and review and analysis capabilities throughout the cemetery. Um, my sense is there's still an opportunity to work, to partner with the Veterans Administration as they do in information technology now and also uh, in other matters. And they've done that with training this last year, but there's still more that they could do. And I, I think Mr. Hallinan has a couple of comments. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yes, just yes. Uh, for a point of fact, mm -hmm. we do have the written agreement between the, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs and, and, and the Secretary of the Army. And Ms. Condon and I have, have uh, spoken with the current Undersecretary, my former boss, Mr. Steve Morrow. And uh, we plan on sending four to five uh, Arlington employees to their organizational and assessment uh, training program in St. Louis, which is the academy that I helped found and start and did a lot of the uh, training of the senior leaders. And that's the beginning. Uh, you know, in order to do a proper assessment based on cemetery operations, because they are kind of unique, uh, you need probably trained people to do an assessment or they can cause more problems than, 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 than issues they, they may fix. Uh, so that agreement's in place. Uh, I expect the first four or five individuals to be trained this year. We, l we look to train uh, additional personnel. We look to t t uh, use that program along with an Army uh, inspection program to assess ourselves. And then we look to invite the VA in maybe in the following year to come also to take a look at us. So we have our peers in, in a similar industry uh, also with, with their objective set of eyes uh, okay. helping us. Very good. Ms. Conant, I want to follow up on the issue of training. You know, in the IG report, it was pointed out as a deficiency, the lack of a comprehensive training program, uh, ensuring that all the employees there have the knowledge and skills necessary to perform their tasks in their specific areas. It seems to me along those lines that defining those core tasks and establishing conditions for training are critical. Uh, can you tell me where you are in making progress towards putting those core tasks in place, having them clearly identified for each employee, and then how they will be trained, and then how those employees will be put in place, how they'll be deployed based upon that training regime? Because as you know, it's sometimes been the cart before the horse. It's the employee starts working, and then later on, you find out, well, they don't have the core competencies or their core tasks aren't identified. If you can maybe um, uh, define where things are going with that particular deficiency pointed out in the IG's report. Um, sir, as you know, the IG pointed out that what we're doing is we're having each employee having an individual development plan. Um, but 
Personally, the first thing that Mr. Hallinan and I had to do at the cemetery was to implement the standards and procedures to effectively not only run the cemetery operations, but to do the administration tasks such as contracting and resource management. So what we are doing is we are making sure that the employees all have a training program and we are doing that, you know, as we speak. So we are addressing that issue because it is of concern of both Mr. Hallinan and I that our employees are trained to do the job rather than what happened in the past where it was just on the job training. And so that is one of the issues that we're working and I don't know, Pat, if there's anything you want to add to that one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you speak about when an employee comes on uh, a job for the first time if they don't have the, the skill set that's required, and, and that would be a flaw, that would be a mistake in the hiring process. One of the things that uh, Ms. Condon and I have done since we've arrived is train the supervisors at Arlington in performance-based interviewing techniques. We've had over a 20 percent turnover in staff in the last 15 months. Uh, that's allowed us to bring in new people with new skill sets based on performance-based interviews. And, and, and I, I have to say that they've done a better job of selecting candidates, uh, feeling pretty confident with, with the quality of people we're bringing on board. Uh, we are training on-site internally. We are also sending people out professionally to be trained, whether it's at St. Louis with the VA under the Memorandum of Agreement, or even the Caterpillar training in Peoria, Illinois, where my equipment operators and Ms. Condon's equipment operators are being trained at the highest industry standard. That'll save the taxpayer money and wear and tear on equipment. That'll save, save us in the prevention of accidents to employees or to visit in public, and we should gain operational efficiencies from the back operators and equipment operators in the future. So when it comes to training, this is going to be the year of intense training, as I, as I uh, spoke to the Inspector General about. Uh, you need to have standards and measures. Each employee will be issued a copy of the standards and measures and trained to those standards and measures, which are the, with the very best in the country. So they will know word for word and line for line what's in those standards and measures. Then you need standard operating procedures to support the standards and measures. Then you need an assessment program to ensure everyone is doing just that. So it's a three-legged uh, three stool, and uh, we're well on our way, sir. And, sir, if I may add, um, one of the things that we're also doing is we're doing succession planning. We're bringing in individuals in at a lower level and actually grooming them to positions within the cemetery, both from the operational side and the administration side. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we now proceed to Ranking Member Jim Cooper of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's very important to get a long-term solution to this problem. I was very impressed by the statement of the American Legion, and to highlight the importance of that statement, I'd like to read from it. The American Legion urges Congress to place the ultimate ongoing responsibility of managing and operating Arlington National Cemetery directly with the Department of Veterans Affairs through the National Cemetery Administration, with ceremonial duties still preserved by the old guard. In the entire government, no other agency can match the tra track record of success and satisfaction of NCA, which is, has worked hard to achieve. NCA is well known for their attention to detail and their ability to perform the task of ensuring the dignity of our fallen mem service members like no other. Uh, they point out how Arlington is struggling to track graves, and NCA has already had a downloadable app for smartphones for some time, so why reinvent the wheel? The American Legion goes on to point out that the DOD has one critical mission, to prepare for and execute the war fighting necessary for this nation's defense. Sidelining resources of money and staff to non-war fighting tasks degrades the efficiency of the DOD. NCA is already managing 131 cemeteries and doing it very well. They go on to point out that in a a satisfaction, consumer satisfaction index, NCA scores a 96, which is higher than any other government agency and higher than any other organization in the United States. So the American Legion believes this is indicative of the level of commitment and getting the job done right for the families. So to me, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a pretty persuasive case, and I think the committee should be looking at something like this. As the American Legion says, the efforts of Director Condon and Superintendent Hallinan are laudable, but they do not represent a long-term solution, nor should that be asked of them. So I appreciate the accomplishments that you've achieved, but we all need to remember this is a scandal that never should have happened. And the Army is always going to be distracted by more important missions, and I know, appreciate um, Inspector General McCoy and others volunteering for duty and getting this done, but 
if the Veterans Administration is doing such a great job and Ms. Condon herself had to hire Mr. Hallinan from the Veterans Administration, I think that uh, a long-term solution is very much headed in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And we now proceed to Mr. Scott of Georgia. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank, thank both of you. And I, I, I'll tell you, um, I do hope that it stays under th the control of where it is as much respect as I have for my colleague. I, I remember quite well as a teenager uh, visiting the beaches of Normandy and the impact that it had on me. And for a long, long time, I had a picture of a tombstone, and my recollection was it said, this soldier known only to God, but, but looking, uh, I, it, it may have said a comrade in arms known, known only to God as I look at, at the things. And, and the, the impact um, that one of those funerals has and, and, and visiting one of um, those treasures um, on, on our teenagers, uh, especially, uh, that are growing up, I, I think is extremely important. And uh, my granddad was a, a B-17 pilot. I can't help but bring that up with the honor flight that's here today. I saw them uh, going uh, in, in the Capitol. And uh, certainly we're, we're losing that generation at a, uh, at a rapid pace. Um, but I, I want to I first say thank you. I want to I thank you for going out and taking your time to take the pictures because it, it's uh, it's important to me as an American, and, and it's more important to uh, those families whose, whose loved ones are uh, being now properly taken care of. General, the, the, the question I have is uh, Andersonville uh, is very close to home for me in Georgia. Uh, I have family members that are buried there. Um, are, are we looking at, at the other areas to make sure that we don't have similar issues um, that, that we have had here. Are you talking about other cemeteries, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't. So there, there are, uh, there's, there's two moves afoot. I mean, first, as the Secretary walked away from this hearing last year, he recognized that there may be other autonomous organizations in the Army. So he, he he created a task force to look at where might he have other autonomous organizations. And that, that, that task force concluded that we have several organizations in the Army that, that had the same kind of governance structure that, mm -hmm. that Arlington National Cemetery had. So now we are moving to look in detail at those. But more to the point of the cemeteries, uh, in addition to the Soldiers and Airmen's Home, which is part of the Arlington National Cemetery Program, or the Army National Cemetery Program, there are 28 cemeteries throughout the Army that are on, for the most part, post camps and stations mm -hmm. in the continental United States. Uh, Ms. Ms. Hallen, as the Executive Director of ANCP, the Army National Cemeteries Program, also has proponency for those, and she is establishing, um, as part of her Department of the Army pamphlet 290-5, she's establishing procedures and processes for proper gravesite uh, burial and management there. Okay. So my sense is that while those cemeteries are much less uh, um, engaged than hers is, than Arlington National Cemetery, she, she understands what she has to do to make those changes at those cemeteries as well. Okay. Uh, one last question or comment. When, when when my grandfather died, we chose to bury him in a uh, in a family plot. Uh, he was a, a a POW in World War II, and and, and we simply asked for uh, an honor guard to uh, carry out uh, the service, the flag, and the uh, the rifles and the playing of taps. And the obviously that. It was carried out from a base in Georgia, but and and the the gentleman in charge was very very respectful, but but commented that you know we simply don't have the manpower to carry out uh, all of the re requests that we're getting. Uh, I, I would just ask. Uh, obviously, this is the priority of this committee uh, hearing right now. That that maybe we consider uh, how we're going to handle uh, the respect for those who. Who are not being um, uh, 
buried in Arlington, and, and maybe uh, even if we worked with uh, ROTC programs throughout the state, I represent a, a very rural area uh, of the country in, in many of the, in, in many of the uh, counties that I represent, and, and whether or not we could work with an ROTC program uh, to make sure that those families have uh, uh, the service that they request. Thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And we now will proceed to Ms. Zongas of Massachusetts. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, it's a pleasure to hear this report compared to um, that what we heard over, which we heard over a year ago. So I want to commend you all uh, for the great progress you've made. And uh, the progress has been significant. But I think if you look at what we heard initially, there was no, way, no other way than up. Uh, so you're on a good path. Uh, and I'd also like to say that um, in my office I have a wounded warrior. His name is Paul Corbett. And I let him know that I'd be attending this hearing today. And he asked that I recognize the tremendous work that he has seen performed by our service members who work at Arlington National Cemetery. He has attended too many ceremonies there as a result of his service, but said he's always been incredibly touched and moved by the seriousness and professionalism of the old guard and their incredible commitment to bearing our soldiers with dignity, the dignity they deserve. So I just wanted to convey that to you. Um, I also, in reading your testimony, was sort of alerted to your website. And I went on it uh, just out of curiosity. I had a free moment and uh, was found it to be very, very well done. So I commend you for that as well. And as I was looking through it, you know, I saw the um, one of the little tabs where it talks about eligibility and who was eligible uh, to be buried there. And I wondered if one of the issues you're contending with in the delay, part of it is a result of the improvements you've made that people are now able to get through. Uh, and otherwise might have given up. But what the process is for determining eligibility, you have criteria. But once somebody makes it known that they would like to bury a loved one there, how, how, how efficient is that process? What does it look like? Does it need uh, more resources? And, or would that help address the delay? And I, whoever feels it would be suitable to answer that. Well, uh, I'll start off by saying I believe that Arlington has, has gotten uh, strong support and enough resources uh, to carry out the mission. Uh, whether adding additional resources is, is going to impact uh, the situation, I really don't believe so. I, I do think it's volume. I think also uh, it's logistics. Uh, there's only a number of open and first internment sections at Arlington. They're all in, in a certain location within Arlington, almost in the corner of Arlington. So we need to be very careful. We, we've gone from 27, our goal is to do uh, 30 internments a day to address the backlog. But we need to be real careful as we try to reach 30 internments a day that we don't impact any of the, any of the other families because of the logistics and the locations. So today we have 27 internments. If we had 30 uh, and the service is going on, would another service come down and, and, and disrupt that family and impact that service in a negative way? So there is a balance. Uh, I don't think the possibility of an, uh, an additional case on uh, an, uh, a changing of work schedules is only going to add one additional internment, five internments a week, 20 for a month. That will start to address the backlog. But uh, I guess I caution uh, my staff, when you raise people's expectations, uh, interest in Arlington may go up again. You may get more calls. The more efficient you, you become, the high, higher standard you operate to, uh, you, you raise people's expectations. So uh, I think we're doing everything we can locally. I don't really think it's a resource issue at this time. I think it's more coordination and logistics. Is eligibility a, a fairly cut and dry determination? Is that fairly quickly determined? Yes, ma'am, it is. And one of the, you did mention one of the factors by putting out the new website. I think one of the issues before was it wasn't clear. People didn't know where to go to actually find what the criteria was for eligibility. So we put out a new administrative guide, it, which is also on our website. Just they didn't have the information, and it's pretty clear on who is eligible to be buried at Arlington. And in the context of our discussion as to whether or not it should be transferred to the VA or remain uh, under the Army, do you keep figures on 
uh, from what branches of the services people are being buried, family members, numbers of family members versus those who have served, do you have th mm -hmm. that broken down into categories? Yes, ma'am, we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Sagas. We proceed now to Colonel Allen West of Florida. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, to uh, visiting chairman and also ranking members. Thank you very much. And to the panel, thank you for joining us here today. And I want to commend you all because the, the Army that my father served in in World War II, that I served in for 22 years, and that my nephew is now serving in, uh, we don't run away from our missions. And we don't run away from challenges. We step up to the plate and we make the corrective action. So I commend you for this and uh, keep pressing on because I don't want to see this great tradition to be taken away from my Army. And that's an important thing that we have to understand. So with that being said, I'd like to ask a little bit about the inspection program because as we know previously, uh, as I said in the IG report, there was not an OIP. So I'd like to get a little bit more information as far as the schedule by which we will have these OIPs coming up. I know, General, you talked about having uh, inspections over the next two years. Now, will those be IG-driven uh, inspections uh, so that there will be reports, or we, will we have a, a formal OIP program from an external uh, entity? And then also, Ms. Condon, if you could kind of give us an understanding about your internal assessment programs that you will have. Congressman. Uh, I'll start with just two things, then I'll turn it over to Ms. Condon. Uh, the, the inspection I was talking about for the next two years required by Public Law 111-339 is an DAIG inspection that will, ha will result in a written report mm -hmm. uh, in order to determine that continuing progress is made based on the findings that we had in 2010. So, th so that will continue. Uh, the, the organizational inspection program is it's kind of there's three to, three tools available to Ms. Conner. One obviously it's an internal program that she can implement herself, but but it also includes staff assistance visits, and and the staff is very focused right now on being at her beck and call to to help in in many ways. Sometimes it's too much help, <laughs> but but the fact is uh, they are there to help, and and she is leveraging that very powerfully. And then the other part is uh, command inspections, things that we can that the Secretary can ask us to go drill into specifically if he wants us to look at things. And then finally, her own internal processes to get out and about and look at, at the operations inside her program to make sure that they're operating properly. And so that, our recommendation to her was that she develop internal processes. The external ones are, are going to continue for the foreseeable future. And Congressman, we've been able to get to the state we are today by having had independent people coming in and look and addressing where issues are, everything from contracting to resourcing to how we do our operations. Um, I am going to follow, you know, in good Army tradition, the Army regulation on, on the program for inspection. We're going to have internal inspections. I am very fortunate from a cemetery operation standpoint that I have Mr. Hallinan here because he was the one who was responsible for all those inspections and that fabulous rating that was given to the VA cemeteries. Um, and I welcome any external agency to come in and, and do an inspection. I think to date we are probably the most inspected organization in government, but that's okay because it's enabled us to fix those issues that need to be corrected for our veterans and their loved ones. Uh, last question, and that kind of goes along with what my, my colleague was saying. In being a victim of your own success um, and understanding the constraints that you have with the capacity there, uh, the increased requests now, um, are you seeing that you have to make any type of changes in the prioritization or the guidelines and criteria that you have for interment there at Arlington National Cemetery? Uh, sir, that's a great segue. Um, as you know, Secretary McHugh is in the process of establishing and we're putting together our first meeting of the Arlington Commission, which is an outside body to look at us. And those are the kind of issues that we would like to present to, to that commission. Do we need to relook at the eligibility requirements for the cemetery as well as the expansion of the cemetery? How best should we utilize the land that are part of the expansion? So that's what we are going to do to address those issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Colonel. We now proceed to Chairman John Runyon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, Ms. Conn and Ms. Halnan, General McCoy, thank you again for your testimony. 
Um, Ms. Condon, um, again, thank you for everything we're doing. I think we, every time we have a hearing, we're enlightened and encouraged by moving forward. But I think the black cloud that hangs over us a lot of times is a lot of what I hear a lot of times. People don't see the forward progress. They see the forward progress, but they want to talk about the bad things. And I want to talk about one right now. Um, as you know, we had a we had a briefing, and I know there's an ongoing criminal investigation going on. But we had a briefing not too long ago in uh, VA with with the Army CIS, and the missing contract that has to do with the, the digitizing the records of the last time when we found the 69 boxes. Have they found that contract yet, as of yet? The base contract, not the one with the subcontractor, but the base contract that we were looking for. Um, sir, I will have to take that one for the record. Since it's under investigation, I am not aware if they found the contract or not. General, do you have any, any idea on that? Uh, no, Congressman. When we we, we do not investigate criminal matters inside the IG, so that was passed to the Criminal Investigation Detach uh, Command, and they've taken that on. We can well, take that back. Well, thank you. Um, and, just to, and just to comment, Mr. Hallinan, when, when we're talking about um, maybe transferring you know, Arlington to, to the VA, just, just a statement, and I think you would probably agree with me because you ran it. Are we not duplicating the same process in the VA here in the Army? We're providing the same service. I don't know if we're duplicating the same process because Arlington does things completely differently. I, I think if, if the VA, in fact, does uh, have Arlington transferred under their jurisdiction, uh, there's going to there's going to be some change uh, that they're going to have to deal with some very real challenges. They do not do graveside burials. Uh, they do not the, the honors that are rendered, the, the coordination of uh, military honors units, uh, the four million tourists, uh, the, uh, the visitation from heads of state who come to pay their respects to America's uh, servicemen and women. Th these complexities they do not deal with. Mm -hmm. They deal with their regional, local cemeteries and their local communities. Uh, Arlington is unique. Arlington is, is special to the American people. It's special to the world. It's the world stage. Uh, so it's very challenging. Uh, my eyes were opened and my ears were opened somewhat, uh, Congressman, when I, when I went to a, uh, a meeting of TAPS. And these are the gold star mothers and fathers. And when we first came on, on, on board, we felt it important to meet with those most deserved stakeholders. And uh, we, we were discussing the many issues that Arlington was facing. But what I got out of it was a number of times they were quite adamant that Arlington remained with the Army and we don't want it to be a VA cemetery. And they kind of directed it towards me because I had VA written all over me at the time. So I was in, in the defensive <laughs> mode. Uh, but on the a, on a, on a most human level, I understood exactly what they were telling me. Despite everything that happened, the honors that they received, and they know that, 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 that the Army has, has taken their eye off the ball, as, as the Inspector General spoke of, but that oh, the, the Army can fix it, the Army has fixed it, and they look for the Army to maintain that, that trust and commitment going into the future. So it, it, it was right there, right in front of us. They were very vocal about it. Understood. And, you know, I, I respect that totally, but I think in a, in a world where we're in, where we, there, there are some very similar aspects for it, and there may be room in the future for a collaboration there to actually, because we are stewards of the taxpayers' money, and that's ultimately what we're about. And there, there may be a, something to move forward to where we can help, uh, help the taxpayer out a little bit more. So I thank you, and uh, Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we conclude, I have a, a brief question, but uh, Ms. Condon, you touched on it. It's expansion. Uh, what reassurance do you have to the American people as to space uh, uh, at the current location of uh, Arlington Cemetery? And uh, looking ahead, uh, has Arlington II uh, been identified? Sir, um, as you know, when Mr. Hallinan and I started, we were given data. And the data that we were given was that we were going to run out of niche space in the cemetery in year 2016 and in-ground burial in 2025, which caused Mr. Hallinan and I to relook the expansion designs, to look at the designs that we inherited from the previous administration for the Millennium Project and the expansion to the Navy Annex. 
Um, what we have done is we, the Army's Concept Analysis Agency, our research, um, organizational research guys, have put a model together for us which looks at not only the available acreage, but also looks at the eligibility criteria so we can change the factors. Because our number one priority is to expand the life of Arlington Cemetery for our veterans and their loved ones to the maximum extent possible. As a matter of fact, last week, Mr. Hallinan and I participated in a design charrette for the Millennium Project. And it was very interesting because I think Mr. Hallinan had much more fun. I had to go back to meetings, but he got to spend more time with them to redesign, to put his expertise to look at the designs of, of how we can expand in the future. And I don't know if you want to say anything else on that, Pat. As I looked at the Millennium Project, uh, some of the expertise that Ms. Condon uh, is referring to is, you know, if, if we change the gravesite layout pattern, and this comes from my years of experience with, with the VA Congressman, we are collaborative. Uh, I'm on the phone with, with, with the Undersecretary, and we share, we're willing to share training and resources, and there's more opportunities in the future, and we're going to take them up on that and, and leverage any, any assistance we can get. But something as simple as changing the gravesite layout from a 5 by 10 gra uh, gravesite to a 3 by 8 will increase the yield and the longevity of Arlington National Cemetery. And as the commission that Ms. Condon spoke of, that the Secretary of the Army has directed, looks at eligibility, it may impact that decision. Because if we can increase the yield at Arlington National Cemetery, we may not have to revisit eligibility. So those that are eligible now would remain so. You would not have to restrict it. There's, there is a finite footprint to Arlington National Cemetery, as we all know. But based on something as simple as changing the gravesite layout, may have a significant impact on longevity at Arlington National Cemetery from an operational standpoint. And thank you. And, and you do identify finite. Uh, uh, is there a second location uh, under consideration at all? Um, sir, that is one of the issues that we are going to present to the Commission for Arlington, is that we all know that there is a finite a finite pl time when we will run out of burial space at Arlington National Cemetery. And so that would be one of the issues that we would tee up to the Independent Commission is what after Arlington. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Hearing none at this time, we adjourn.